Okay, I have a question for you. One of the main characters of the book, um, him and his wife have a son. He is two or three years old. They've created memories and a life and all of that with him. One day there is a knock at the door from a stranger saying, the child that you have raised all these years is not actually yours. Oh no. And I have your child. Oh. Is this a switched at birth? This is a switched situation. at birth situation. Hi, I'm Georgia, and welcome to episode 75 of the Hope Book Club podcast, where we chat about books from a hope filled Christian lens. Today's episode is going to be a little bit of a different one as we cover a genre that I have never heard talked on the podcast about before, at least while I have been host psychological thrillers. Joining me to discuss, though, is my colleague and bestie, Elle Robertson. Welcome to the Hope Book Club. Thank you for having me, Georgia. I'm actually so excited to be here. Love that. Okay, let's get into the book. What have you brought for me today? Please show the camera. Uh, Playing Nice by J.P. Delaney. Now, I have heard of this author before. Right. Um, They're they're a New York Times bestselling author. I know they've done a bunch of thrillers. Right. Tell me, what is this book about? Let me paint you a picture. Okay, I have a question for you and I'm going to position it in the way as if when you are reading this as a reader, right, this is the position you're put in as a reader. Okay. One of the main characters of the book, um, him and his wife have a son. He is two or three years old. They've created memories and a life and all of that with him. One day there is a knock at the door from a stranger saying, the child that you have raised all these years is not actually yours. Oh, no. And I have your child. Oh. The question that you're presented with as a reader (laughs) is, would you want to switch back? That that, Firstly, that is an impossible question. It it, it is midday on a Friday. L, please. Okay, secondly, I am not a parent. Nor am I. So I I don't even want to imagine the the shock, the emotion surrounding that. Let me, okay, let me talk through the two options, I guess. Okay. okay, option one, if you switch the babies. This is, the plot is going to thicken, okay. just as you know. So option one, you decide to make the switch. Okay. You have essentially, you know that child is biologically yours, mm-hmm. but that child is a stranger. How old? How old are they? They're three. Three? Yeah. Oh. So you've got three years of meeting this child's every need, creating bonds and memories, loving this child as if it's your own flesh and blood. And here comes another child that is actually your own flesh and blood. Do you swap back? And the logic is like, maybe they're young enough for us to be able to swap back. And that's what I was thinking. That's why I asked the age because it's like three, I think I don't remember much of when Mm -hmm. I was three, but I probably remember a little. And as they say, the body keeps the score. Your body would remember that, that traumatic event. Yes. However, if the children grew up and they found out that their parents knew when they were three years old yep. that they were switched at birth and didn't tell them or do anything about it, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would do. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, there Please you go. don't ask me anything like right. that ever again. Okay, well, it gets worse. I'm about to ask you something worse. Okay. <laughs> okay. Then you find out that your actual birth child, the one that you did not raise, uh-huh. has severe disabilities. And the family that is raising your child at the moment is financially much better off than you are. Oh, it's impossible. No. It's impossible. No, it's impossible. I'm not even going to entertain that. Okay. Don't entertain it. The book entertains it for you. Okay. So basically the whole plot is what them trying to figure it out. Well, like. Because I assume if it's a thriller, something terrible is going to happen. There's twists, well, right? How did this happen? How right. did the switch happen? The beginning of the book, you're obviously like, what on earth is going on? And you're put in this position where you're you're literally, your heart is being pulled in different directions, being like, what would I do if I was in this situation? Because you can see the parents thinking through this, being like, what is the best option for us here? If I want to take my biological child back, I may not be able to provide for them in the way and give them the quality of life that the other family might be able to give them. Mm-hmm. It's just insane. So you follow that along. Obviously, there is a twist in the story mm-hmm. as to why, how this all happens. Okay. There are deeper, darker problems. Deeper, darker problems. More sinister problems. We can explore those if you want, or we no. cannot. Okay. 
we can explore some of them as long as it's not uh spoilers no spoilers no spoilers do you want to go past them then <laughs> um no um we don't have to go past them but it does introduce the concept of well a personality type which is the psychopath mm. diagnosed psychopathy is that one of the parents one of the four parents <gasps> has diagnosed psychopathy which... did we did we know that before or this no. is become, this has come to light this has come to light oh goodness me you know and the plot thickens and there is like things that are slowly revealed that you're like what is going on here the way that it's painted is so so interesting i learned a lot about the diagnosed psychopath mm. in this because there's a, actually a bit of like medical background as to what um traits qualify you to be a psychopath um and i mean they're living amongst us well no 100 percent. and i think that there is a very real thing i think with uh crime shows and true crime um that kind of phenomenon that's come out in the past probably five ten years that the words like psychopath are th- and sociopath are thrown around loosely loosely when really it, it is a, it's a medical diagnosis yes and comes with a strict set of criteria yes and so within that you actually find how how they live in like obviously because they're they're completely mainstream these people who have like psychopathic tendencies of course and for the most part it takes a long time to diagnose someone who is a psychopath and you can be around them consistently even like some of your closest friends and family and not pick up that they have psychopathic traits because the kind of traits are manifested in amongst other things so they are extremely charismatic they are extremely easy to get along with. People are drawn to them and they have really infectious personalities. And then like other little things come out, like how manipulative they can be mm. um, and how they get their own way. But those things take a while for you to recognize because you're so engulfed and drawn in by the other really positive qualities that they have that you tend to you know, write off those other negative qualities thinking like, okay, yeah, but that's okay because they've drawn you in. So how did you feel while reading all about that? Did you all, all did you feel uneasy? Like what how did you kind of feel in your in your body? Because for yeah. me, I would be like as a highly anxious person, I don't know if I could be constantly reading about that because I'm like I just become suspicious of everyone. Oh. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I was like oh my gosh. You know who has these tendencies? I could like I could point out parts in like people around where I'm like interesting about that interesting not saying that they are because you have to I be I was going to say do you find that help I That's wasn't probably actually probably not helpful <laughs> <laughs> Look I'm not a qualified psychologist who sure. can diagnose things but definitely makes you hyper aware of like um, people's um, characteristics or tendencies that you're like wow that aligns with really well or that personality has like a striking resemblance to something I've seen or something I've watched or someone I know or whatever it may be and um, one of the most interesting parts in the book is there is a um, I think it was like the police or a, a medical test that they use to diagnose like people whether or not they have psychopathic tendencies mm. and you do a like you it's a scoring system there are actual questions in the book oh, wow. um, with a scoring system and I made me and my husband do it <laughs> to see where we scored on this scale great news spoiler alert none of us are psychopaths fantastic so it's, thank it's goodness very intense. and I think it's also important to note here that just because you have psychopathic tendencies does not make you a criminal um correct or sociopathic Imp- tendencies can we can know. we say that um this Please obviously know. books like these take this stuff to the extreme correct and I do want to have a, a chat with you about these kinds of books in general and, and pick your brain about psychological thrillers and actually why you like them so much I haven't read that many I've read a a few kind of mainstream ones, Gone Girl, Girl on the Train, The Silent yeah. Patient. Did you enjoy? Love them. Love okay. Them. Okay. Love is a strong word. Right. It I is. devoured them, yes. but I felt uneasy. Right. I can't read them all mm. the time. It needs to be like one that I read once in a blue moon because I'm probably thinking about it for the next, you know, two to five yes. business years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> See, when you said business, it, I thought you were going to say days. Days. No, no, no. Years. Yeah. Years. Um, <laughs> why do you think... 
you gravitate towards this genre so much? You already said because it's the page turner situation. And I totally understand that. Why do you think we as a society are so hung up on books like this? Because they fly off the shelves. Look, I can only speak for myself. True story. Growing up, my dad is a registered psychologist. When I was a young child, mm. um, my dad used to study criminology. Um, he specialized in criminal psychology and he would read me true cases as bedtime stories oh. <laughs> when I was probably around like no joke, like between six and eight years old. Oh, that can't have been good. Yeah. I still remember him. Uh, mm. But I clearly Point. love psychological thrillers. Mm. Point. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the face and I said, take it as you will. So yeah, okay. there you go. Maybe that's why I have an affinity for it is because I grew up on like with that being a thing. When my dad read me those stories, he wasn't like, and then he yeah, crept yeah, yeah. through the, you know what I mean? He, it was very factual. It was very, it was based, it was had a, it was based from psychology. It was like, this person grew up like this. It may have led them to think like this and that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think everyone has a personal affinity like you, but I, I did do some research as to how, um, as to why I should say um, society in general actually really likes these kinds okay, of books. Okay, yeah, I'd be keen to hear um, it. Number one, and I think we can speak for the last five years, books like these for many are just pure escapism. Yes. Because it's so far removed from your actual reality that mm -hmm. it's like, well, nothing like this is ever going to happen to me. That's right? right. So you're able to just kind of step outside your own world for a second and just be completely immersed in someone else's world. And when we have things like a pandemic going on, where all of a sudden it's so many of our worst fears realize and we just want to step out of the reality for a second. Yeah. It's actually, ironically, books like this yes. that can provide that escapism. On that note, it can actually almost highlight the goodness and safety in your own life. It sounds so bizarre. No, good point. But it's... As a juxtaposition. Yeah, because yeah. you're like, well, at least... <laughs> it sounds so terrible, but it's like you read these terrible stories and it's like, well... At least I it's not be, that. I might be struggling through these things, but at least it's not that. At least, at least it's, it's not yeah. that. And as you said, I think these thriller books also give us that kind of adrenaline rush without us being in those dangerous situations. Yeah. So, you know, you want that kind of thrill when you read. You want it to be a page turner. You want to feel the emotions. Yes. But you don't want to actually have to go through these terrible things. That's right. So oh, that's a way definitely for, a, uh, for you to get that, I guess, that kick, that thrill. But also I think, and this is the main one, for me personally, is when I read books like these and even crime fiction books, just regular mysteries, it gives you a sense of control because even though you don't know what's going to happen necessarily, it's very formulaic. It starts with a crime, you suspect all the characters, it's gonna have a twist near the end and then it's all gonna be wrapped up, yes. right? And I think when you go into a reading experience, whether it's wholesome or not, you want to be able to kind of know what you're getting yourself into, especially if the world feels unpredictable. Mm. So that, yes. they're the kinds of things. Research is definitely, yeah, shows that it stems from a combined desire for control, uh, but also new experiences and stories. Because you're not going to mm. want to read something that you've read before. Yes. But even if it's just like a slight twist. Yes. And I think now that brings us to the point in the episode where we bring faith into it which is so bizarre because when you read books like this sometimes it can feel like the furthest thing from christianity ever and i know that a lot of people who listen to the podcast a lot of people who have even been on the podcast struggle to justify reading these kinds of books personally because it's like you know i don't want to be feeding into that uh you look at you know philippians 4 you know whatever is right whatever is noble whatever is true and a lot of people take that uh, quite literally into the content they consume, which there is no judgment here. If that is what works for you and your family, absolutely go through that. Uh, do you, does that kind of come into play when when you read? I I know that you said you had that guilty conscience growing up, and now it's you know you, you've you've moved on from that a little bit. Do you do you ever feel that kind of sense of uneasiness? Look, to be honest with you, it is one of those things. I am. I do try to be mindful of the things that consume like my mind and my thoughts. And I am a firm believer in, in terms of what you um, expose yourself to, like, you know, has a heavy impact mm. on, on, you know, the way that you think and all of those kinds of things. So I do look for some reason, it's easier for me to digest written. I feel the same heaviness that you talk about when I watch these kinds of things, which I still love watching. <laughs> 
but I have to monitor the amount because I can see the impact that has on me if I ingest too much of it. Same as podcasts, like true crime podcasts. I love a good true crime Mm. podcast, but I have to monitor the amount that I ingest because outside of my conscious and into my subconscious I feel a heaviness even though in my conscious I feel fine and I love ingesting that kind of stuff it's so interesting to me and it's interesting you say a sense of control because I was doing a personality test uh yesterday with some mates and one of the things that it said about me is like loves to be in control of my environment so it's interesting that you said that today so maybe that is one of those things but um In terms of of that kind of stuff, I just am aware of myself. And I think as you get older, um, you learn more about yourself. And for me, I know that ingesting it in written form is just enough for me where I don't feel heavy about it. Um, But if I watch or listen to too much of it, I do. And then it's always good to balance it out with um, surrounding yourself by with really positive, uplifting, healthy content. Um, and, and pumping that with yourself. So I must say for me on a ratio of ingesting information, I would say that 80% of it is really positive and the other 20% is this. So it's still far outweighs. I think that's so fantastic and such a great point, especially when you think about books because written content, we can only go as far as our imagination lets us. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, podcasts or definitely, uh, you know, this for films and TV shows, we have really no control over kind of what we're seeing there. Like we're able when we read a book to just create what we want with our mind's eye yeah, that's and you're right. able to kind of get to the limits of that and not go beyond what you feel comfortable with because it's your own mind yes absolutely i think it's also important just to as you said just look at our motivations also to consume this content if you're mm. if you're looking at for it for a you know pure escape and enjoyment from your own life and you recognize that I think that's fine. And if you you are unsure, I think it's also important to like talk to other people in your life that read. If you have other readers that are Christian, they mm. probably have thought about this stuff <laughs> a whole bunch yeah, as well. For sure. Um and also pray. Like talk to God. Yeah. You talk to him about psychological thrillers. I'm sure he'd be, <laughs> yeah. he'd be thrilled. Uh, we can pray and talk to God about anything. So I, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer here. Do what's best for you. Yeah. I definitely think psych thrillers, they do have a place. Um, and that's proven by the amount that they sell. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was such a pleasure getting to chat to you, Elle. Thank you so much for being yes, on the podcast. Of course. I had so much fun. Thank you for inviting me. 